Okay, and thank you again for joining us for another edition of the Just As Easy Show. You know, today's topic is the school to prison pipeline. And by school to prison pipeline, of course, I'm referring to the system. We're talking about the disproportionate amount of students of color um, who are piped into the prison system as early as kindergarten, according to the Dignity in Schools campaign. And so today we have a, a very distinguished guest who is the assistant warden of the Golden State Prison, Mr. Dan Meyer. Thank you for joining us yes, today. Thank you, Mr. Griffin. Absolutely. So I'd like to begin by kind of sharing a little bit more information that I was able to get from the Dignity in Schools campaign related to the school to prison pipeline. Yes. And so I, I would like for you to just kind of share, after I share the statistics, I'd like for you to kind of share, you know, from your own perspective, yeah. whether personally or professionally, you know, anything that you'd like to chime in about. So what the Dignity in Schools campaign has to say regarding the school to prison pipeline is that through an unfair, subjective, and zero tolerance discipline practice and policies, students are regularly suspended and expelled from school. Um, also, the exposure to police increases the probability of arrest. And by that, they're talking about the fact that a lot of schools are increasingly having school resource officers on the campuses. And so, again, the exposure of police increases the probability of arrest, and it means suspended and expelled students are three times more likely to come in contact with the juvenile justice system and the detention in a juvenile <clears throat> justice uh, facility. And then, by, by uh, in turn, getting placed in juvenile detention increases the risk of youth ultimately dropping out of school. And then finally, in turn, the increase in juvenile detention and dropping out of school increases the probability of adult incarceration by 22 percentage points. And so a lot of information is, is shared here, and we'll have a lot more to share. But any thoughts on that, Mr. Meyer? Yes, uh, uh, I think there is a correlation there uh, between the, the disparity in treatment with youth and uh, getting expelled from school, which translates uh, to, to people taking uh, a path that leads to incarceration. Mm -hmm. uh, without uh, staying on track and progressing uh, through the education uh, timeframes, uh, like a normal you know, uh, time that most students would normally go through, mm -hmm. uh, education is delayed. And when education is delayed, it becomes uh, kind of an afterthought and other things take its place. And things that uh, feed into, uh, you know, uh, this lifestyle that people want right now. And so, so along sure. with that, uh, uh, there's choices to be made. And a lot of times bad choices are made, mm -hmm. which leads uh, to a lot of uh, people that we see end up in our, you know, prisons. Yes. And I, I totally agree with you. Let me share one other statistic. Um, uh, over 6,500 California students, and we are in California, over 6,500 California students are expelled each year with minimally or no educational instruction provided while they are expelled. And so that's really important because um, there's a lot of uh, information out there that talks about what happens to students when they miss even one day of school and how detrimental that is to their overall education. And so I know I, I read California statistics right now, but I want to just tell you that this is a pervasive uh, phenomena. It really is. I, I grew up in school. I, I attended schools in Florida, public education system in Florida. And, you know, students are expelled and suspended all the time. And and there wasn't always, and we're talking, of course, about 20, 30 years ago, there wasn't always follow through from the uh, school standpoint to make sure that I received education while, not me, but students who are expelled or suspended receive the educational support that they need while they are away from school. And so, um, one of the things that does come to mind that is a, a specific and personal anecdote that I can kind of um, recall is that when I was in the 12th grade, when I was in the 12th grade, I was taking a home economics class. Mm -hmm. and, and Mr. Myers knows me. And so in addition to being a talk show host, I'm also a writer. So I like to speak in very specific terms. And I think it's applicable and appropriate that I do so, in, in fact, with this topic. But when I was in the 12th grade, um, I had a really cute little um, a young white teacher who was the home economics teacher. And one day she came into the class and she brought a salad forward and, and the salad had olives and bell peppers and a lot of other things that I wasn't accustomed to seeing on a salad. And she said to the class, guys, by the end of the period, you're gonna make a salad like this. And before I knew anything, my mouth 
had made a statement out loud. And I said, oh, this kind of style is that white people eat. I was ignorant as all get out. But at the same time, I was speaking from my own cultural perspective because I hadn't seen those kinds of things in a salad. And here, you know, this nice white teacher was presenting this. And so her response, though, to my statement was that she sent me to the office right away. And so I went to the office. The principal uh, sent me to an alternative school for five days. And while I was at the alternative school, um, you know, I missed out on the home economics class. I missed out on my normal PE class. I missed out on English and I missed out on math. And, you know, thank God I'm the type that, you know, I was able to return back to my normal school setting after five days and I was able to pick up and and not um, be harmed by it. But, you know, I think now about those students who are expelled and suspended and they don't always receive their support. And they're, you know, that much closer to being a part of the school to prison pipeline. So I just thought it was appropriate that I share that. And that is a good antidote uh, um, because... That is probably more common than we would, would, you know, have the statistics that show. I think so, too. Um, But, uh, yes, uh, if there's not a particular type of uh, response, I think uh, people are too prone to uh, to, to take and take action and not realize the consequences of actions that lead to further consequences and, you know, just uh, progresses where the student no longer wants to go back. And, uh, And this leads to a lifestyle. And and that leads to um, bad choices, obviously. But uh, I, yeah, I, I could see where that could happen quite often, actually. I'm sure it does, and, I'm, and not just in one state, but I think throughout the nation. But I want to ask you. I know that you're assistant warden, but just talk to me about any personal experiences that uh, or anecdotes come to mind. Well, uh, we see topic. a lot of guys. I, I, I'm over the education department, the vocational department, and. Uh, uh, we call it a reentry department or our department uh, it's called uh, continual care which is changing uh, behavior it's okay. uh, different types of uh, treatments and therapies to change uh, thinking patterns and decision really? making yeah that is very, wait that's fascinating i want i want to come back to that yeah and and I, i'll be happy to talk about that uh, so it's uh it's uh, something that we've really stepped up uh Three and a half years ago, mm-hmm. we've uh, implemented this program called Continuum of Care, company wide, and it basically it's structured where it goes through different phases where we bring uh, offenders in and we assess where they're at, and then we intervene and based on their needs, we'll provide like either anger management, cognitive behavior intervention, ah. substance abuse treatment, family relations class because a lot of uh, a lot of the 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 guys that we see or that come through our facility, uh, they've come from broken homes. Uh, they've either not had a parent, a, you yes. know, two parents, or no parents, or just a, a just a broken you know relationships with their family. I'm glad you share that, uh, Mr. Myers, because there is this thought that's out there, a very pervasive thought that once uh, students or people in general are in the penal system, that there's no. Um, there's no, no rehabilitation that's occurring. And so it's good and refreshing to hear that you say that that's actually taking place, at least within your facility, right? Oh, yeah. yeah um, definitely. What, what are the ages of the people who are Well, the ages, uh, they have to be uh, 21 years of, old, uh, of age, you know, mm-hmm. in our facilities. Uh, and it goes on up to uh, retirement age. Uh, I've been at the same facility now for a little over 15 years. And uh, I've seen the ages uh, just continue to grow it used to be in the 20s and the 30s mm-hmm. but now it just continues to to seem to cover the whole spectrum of uh you know uh, 21 to 65 i have uh, one guy that's going to be retiring here in a couple weeks actually and he was worried about uh when he releases here soon uh what resources are going to be available for him when he releases wow he's going to retire from he's going to retire like normally retirement age uh huh. So he hopes to retire. From Has he been contributing to the? Uh, he's been uh, trying to. Uh, he's been trying to rehabilitate himself and making, uh, you know, choices by going and taking classes. Uh, you know, he's been taking vocational classes. And this is interesting, though, so because when you talk about someone who's been incarcerated, retiring instantly, my mind goes to like I'm thinking in terms of. Um, SSI, you know, those kinds yeah, of, like, yeah, like yeah. D- does he have any kind of, will he have income coming in? That's what we're, we're looking at. Okay. Because we don't have a lot of guys 
that fit into that uh, category. So right. it's kind of a new area. Because then he's, he still has to support himself somehow financially. So I just wondered about that. And I'm glad, again, that you talked about changing behavior patterns that you do with the anger management. Is there anything that you do um, at your facility or in the penal system in general um, to help people get their uh, high school diplomas? Oh, yes. Uh, we've been working uh, with our client, uh, CDCR. We call, uh, since we're a private uh, contracted facility, we call our uh, the, the people that we work with, our client, and that's the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. And uh, they really want, uh, with our contract with them, to focus on literacy. So we uh, have uh, different uh, literacy programs that we're focusing on. Uh, it goes uh, from ESL, ABE, mm -hmm. uh, GED, and then, like I said, our other programs on top of that. But it breaks it down. It has uh, what they've called uh, ABE uh, 1, which is our e tape uh, scores between uh, 0 and, I think, 3.9. Mm -hmm. ABE 2, which is like 4.0 to, I think, 6.9. And then pre-GED or ABE 3, and it goes like 7.0 to 9.9. .9. So how does that work? Um, people who don't have people who don't have their di diplomas are they eagerly seeking them out like what percentage would you say are actually actively seeking out getting their high school oh, gosh. or do you have those figures i don't like, have those figures but it's fairly high it is high uh you know at least uh i'd say about half of the guys that come in don't okay. have a, so a g or high school diploma and they recognize the importance of it oh, yes. once they get out. And it's, uh, they've uh, realigned uh, the educational track. It used to be once you got to a 6.0 uh, reading level, grade mm -hmm. placement level, you were done with education, so you didn't have to progress any further. Really? Yeah. That, that was uh, when I first got there uh, 15 years ago. That was the norm. Wow. And then it went up to 9.0, and so right at the high school level. And then now they want you to get your high set or your your GD. So what is the thought behind that? The raising of the educational bar for inmates? Well, it's a it's a gateway to uh, being employable because Absolutely. you need a you know high school diploma to get a job. So that was the thought behind that and which it needs to be and, mm -hmm. and uh, so I was glad when they realigned the curriculum to that point. Mm -hmm. And then with no child left behind, they tried to put all the core into, you know, the different cores, but it just got really hard uh, to do all the different core uh, curriculum, you know, that they required. Sure. Because uh, inmates get transferred from facilities a lot of times, and they couldn't continue with their pathway to education to, to get everything done. Yes. I can see that, too. I, I appreciate that. I, I want to ask you something. I'm going to go off on a tangent a little bit, and then okay. you'll, we'll have to come back. But, you know, there's this thought, this pervasive thought that's out there that inmates, whether, you know, in a state facility or, or federal, that they are living an extravagant, like, luxurious lifestyle that's got billiards and cable TV and all this kind of stuff. So is, is that really kind of – and I've never visited a facility. So well, is there any uh, – uh, it, uh, there, that? There's uh, that perception. I right. think the public uh, has that perception that uh, you know they haven't made. But there's uh, research uh, behind that. And, uh, again, I don't have the, the figures behind it, but uh, there's, there's different ways to look at it. You can take and, and someone that breaks the law, you can warehouse them okay. and then hope that they, once they're done with their, their incarceration term, mm -hmm. come out and be you know rehabilitated. Uh -huh. Or you can provide different uh, sources of uh, ways to uh, take and fill those time slots, okay, with education, with programs, and along with and that. And with cable? Well, yeah, uh, okay. because uh, if you I'm want I'm not to, judging. I'm just trying to get no, a picture. No, but you make a good point. If you want someone to, to assimilate a normal lifestyle mm -hmm. and you're holding, withholding something uh, just out of, well, you shouldn't have this because. Right. How are you, uh, you going to release them back into society with some assimilation of a normal lifestyle. All right. And so there are others on the other side of the table who would argue that gives them something to come out and work toward instead of coming from the, being incarcerated and, and to, yeah, right. Cause you know, it, it, I mean, yes, there's society. always two different ways to look at it, Sure, but I'd rather have someone, and this is CDC's uh, philosophy now uh -huh. from, uh, from prison to our neighborhood or to your neighborhood. That's their new model now. That gets so my that's, attention. that's what the R went into CDCR back in 2007. Okay. In uh, 2007, I believe it was, when they passed uh, Assembly Bill 900. Um, yeah. 
they they want to really focus on uh, rehabilitation. And with the pass, passage of Prop 57 a few years ago, they really expanded this now. And so there's all sorts of incentives that uh, their inmates have. But uh, would you say that, you know, it could uh, make someone, you know, uh, you give them all these benefits? That's what we're trying to do now. Because if, uh, if you withhold these benefits, a lot of these guys are never going to have the, the opportunity. And that's what uh, this whole thing, I think, hinges on, opportunities. Yes. So what do you say in your professional capacity to those who argue that, hey, these guys get locked up and they're living better than me. They got three hots and a cot, which means, you know, three meals and, and a bed. <laughs> and I'm sleeping on my mom's couch and I've never been in trouble before. And I, you know, Well, it, it can be frustrating for those that don't appreciate it. And we have a certain number of guys that they're going to complain they're never happy. Right. <laughs> but uh, that's just this, you know, society in general. Uh, there's always going to be people that are never you know, appreciative of what they do have. So, in general, most of the guys are appreciative. Um, you know, and I think human nature kind of uh, feeds into that too. Uh, you know, some people think that the more you give someone, the the more they're not going to appreciate it. But we see that uh, yes, uh, there's two sides to that. Sure. Uh, those that want to make something for themselves are doing it, and they're not coming back. And those that are not rehabilitated yet are going to mm -hmm. come back. Uh, research shows it takes four to seven times sometimes to change. Wow. To go through these, uh, you know, series of interventions. Which is expensive. Yeah, it's for expensive. The sure. I mean, uh, I know growing up, I, I didn't become who I was without making a lot of mistakes along the way. Let's talk about that. What'd you do? What'd you get into? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, let's let's keep going on. Let's keep going. Right? We got to keep you employable, right? <laughs> let's stay on the... All right, cool. No problem. Hey, so I want to... Um, and this one is kind of uh, kind of heavyweight. There is this thought that the United States, and I think it's uh, statistically true, that the United States has the highest incarceration rate of any nation worldwide. In fact, I want to read this statistic, that, that, again, that I got um, from the same source, D Dignity in Schools campaign. But it says 61% of the incarcerated population are black or Latina, despite the fact that these groups are, they only represent 30% of the U.S. population. That's the first uh, tenet. And then... Nearly 68% of all men in federal prison never earn a high school diploma. We spoke to that. And then finally, the fact that the U.S. has the highest incarceration rate in the world is no surprise, and the road to lockup starts in the school system. And so I want to go back to that part with the U.S. having the highest incarceration rate. And, you know, when I think about the United States, I think about the home of the free, the home of the brave, and all that. And then, you know, we are the greatest country in the world. Yeah. There's no question about that. But, you know, I wanted you to talk about any theories as to why we have the highest incarceration rate in the world. Well, I think it's our Constitution. The way it was designed, it was not to uh, to, to lock people up and uh, throw them away, you know. Mm -hmm. A lot of people th still believe that's the, you know, once you commit a crime, uh, that's it. Your, your, you know, your, your value is gone. Mm -hmm. And uh, people, they bring a lot of value regardless of the past they have with them. And that's what I try to teach uh, my staff to, to bring out in inmates. Mm -hmm. We all have value. To what degree we have to, to find that value. So I think with that being said, uh, you know, our society gives us that opportunity to, to have second, third, or fourth chances. Sure. You know, and that's the great part about our, you know, us being who we are as a society. But, you know, it's just how, how you look at it or how you frame it. And a lot of people frame it in the negative perspective. Sure. You know, uh, we're giving these guys all this opportunity. But step back for a second and think, what if you make that mistake? What if sure. you don't take or the Uber? Or your loved one does. Or, yes, you or, or your loved one. What if place? you don't take the Uber and you get behind a car and drive and you get to uh, kill someone, uh, you know, driving drunk? Right. It could happen to anybody. Some and empathy, uh, but empathy and, and rehabilitation goes a long way. Yes, uh, it does. I think uh, we have to sit back and be real in, in our, our perspective because this could happen to anyone. Absolutely. Yeah, so yeah. Three strikes rule. What are your thoughts on that? I think the three strikes was good in theory, but I think uh, it didn't work out uh, as theorized. Uh, most uh, things that uh, we think are going to work uh, actually don't work as intended. And what it did was it inflated our prison population because a lot of but the, there was some there's some that would argue that that was the 
the impetus behind it. You know, there's some that will argue that that was, you know, uh, the plan, the ultimate plan was to lock up browns and blacks. So speak and, to that. And that's interesting uh, um, in itself. I mean, you could probably just talk about that in and of itself, but it, it did. Uh, I mean, obviously the numbers, if you look at it, it did uh, lock up quite a few people on charges that uh, shouldn't be, you know, putting someone in prison for life. For, yeah, I, I think it was uh, a flaw in the design, and uh, it, it didn't take into account a lot of things. And uh, so here we are on the years later with this huge overinflated prison population, and now it's funny how the pendulum has swung the other way, sure. and we're trying to give everyone, uh, for the most part, or most people, rehabilitation. Sure, sure. And so, I wonder if it's just a trend. Just like education, it looks like the legal system uh, goes through like trends and ebbs and flows. Well, I, I'm I'm looking at that too, and, uh, and I'm wondering, you know, if the, if this thing's going to go back and forth, and then finally reach a, a medium where it's going to be static for a while. Sure. Uh, but the real right now is what we're looking at is the population in the prisons and from the information I have is declining about 1,800 inmates here this year. Is that right? Or about 1,300 I'm sorry. Uh, wow, can you repeat that? I don't about think that 1,300 uh, offenders is going to be down this year between 2018 and 2019 in uh, California. All right, and what accounts for that? The rehabilitative programs of Prop 57. To educate us on Prop 57. Okay, Prop means. 57, just briefly, was passed by voters uh, overwhelmingly uh, a year and a half ago in okay. the fall elections. And uh, so it was put on the ballot, and so it sounded good to put incentives for inmates to get out earlier. But then no one knew how to implement it. Okay, so it sounded good. It's like, cool, we got this thing. Now what are we going to do with it? Uh -huh. So they finally put together uh, uh, incentives, and uh, this started in August of uh, a year ago in 2017. Mm -hmm. And what I started doing is giving time off for, like, if I took a, a class and I reached cert certain segments of the class, and they call them milestones. Sure. And this has been a program that's been in effect since 2010. But they, they created a lot more of these milestone uh, incentives and so if I completed like my GED test, there's five different sections, I get time off for each section that I completed. Okay. Like up to like two weeks in some cases. All right. So uh, you could get uh, anywhere from like a month to six weeks off. So it's a praise and reward system, which is also very effective in education too. Right. So that the carrot was, you know, they sure. dangled that carrot ahead of you. And then they, they put it where you could bank, they could get up to 12 uh, weeks off in one year. Then after that you could bank, you know, for subsequent years what were some of the other um carrots if you will so earning uh, yeah credits, so good they, behavior would that yeah good ones? behavior but they didn't what they did was uh they'd made it mostly with programming so they had uh the rehabilitative achievement credits uh, programs so uh they have different things that we put in like uh, aa and na for example okay uh it's a class that's inmate led sometimes we get volunteers or a staff sponsor to uh to sit in and, and just to let be there to support the inmates and you know make sure that they're staying on track with the, the, the curriculum but uh, after so many hours uh, throughout the year like 52 hours they get time off their sentence and oh, so wow. or and then you can go up to 200 I think eight hours uh, during the course of the year but it's just seat time sitting and being in this and and actually showing up mm -hmm. and uh, so there's a lot of programs like that there's one called uh, Getting out by going in, uh, that's one that we're looking at. By going at. into? Uh, in, getting out by going yeah, in. Yeah, it's, it's a it's a it's some type of program that uh, guys talk about their, their problems and how they can readjust when they get gotcha. back Gotcha. Just kind of escaping a certain paradigm, a certain mindset. certain mindset. And then there's faith-based programs. Cool. Uh, Malachi Dads is a big one that uh, has been going around. It it's helps Ben to realize their role through a Christian uh, base or faith-based programs as a, as a father. And a lot of these uh, guys have never, you know, Don't fully have father figures at home. Right, to, right. To, to show, you know, or to mentor on how to be a father. Sure. And so that's been really popular. So by sitting into the, these classes and, uh, excuse me, and si and, and uh, having so much time in, they sign rosters, and then we take and we put it in the computer, and then after so long, uh, they get a certificate, and then it's automatically recorded, and their sentence is recalculated, and then time comes off. Absolutely. So, and it allows the um, inmates to actually own what time they get. You know, they, they right. take some ownership. They take of some ownership of it. Sure. 
And so along with that, uh, you know, uh, people may think, well, gosh, you know, that's it's not really rehabilitating. But when you look at it, it is because a lot of guys would never take that first step. Sure. For whatever reasons, uh, you know, it's not cool to do or the pride and or I whatever. And I think it's teaching, it's teaching the principle that, hey, you take a step and, you know, things will work out. You, but you have to, you know, the shortest distance, and I'm sure I'm messing this up, but if you want to get any place, it begins with the first step. You have to take a exactly. step exactly. to get where you, you want to go. You know, you don't really like to sound like a cliche, but it's true. You know, you have to take that first step. And so, and, and, and so like, everyone's doing it now. It's not just certain groups. Uh, because in the prison environment, you know, people watch each other and, and they still cling, even though they're not uh, really in gangs in our facilities because mm-hmm. they've dropped out. But they still, you know, watch each other and, and that uh, politics sure. is still in place. Yeah. Yeah. And so on. they compare notes and they watch each other what they do. But basically they're starting to take ownership and they want to get out. So they want to program. So it becomes about... You know, getting into the classes and so they can get out sooner. So all of this is a part of AB 57? Prop 57. Prop, Prop 57. Proposition 57. So that's one of the components. Um, uh, another one is if you get your GED and then if we can verify it, you get 90 days automatically off your sentence. Oh, nice. Yeah, so that was, uh, it's called education merit credit. Very nice. Yeah, so that's another thing, that another component that's put on. And if you get your uh, uh, college, um, you know, diploma, you get 180 days off automatically. And we've had a few guys that have done that. Six months, yeah. And it's actually, um, I don't know, I think I talked to you about this in the doctorate program that uh, we've we've talked about in the past. Yes, the doctorate program. And uh, social economic status. There was a lot of research about, uh, I remember when I was going through some of the classes Mm -hmm. uh, and doing research, there's uh, evidence to support that uh, for those that get... uh, college level uh, classes Mm -hmm. and expose themselves to college level programs, their chances of going back and recivitating are much, much less because of their social economic status is starting to come up now. Sure. And they're getting exposed to those opportunities that they never had before. Absolutely. So that is very, that's very good stuff. Hey, I want to go back to, to something else. Um, We talked about Prop 57 Mm -hmm. and we talked about how you got into um, the field. But, you know, in terms of education, we still have, you know, students who are misbehaving in school. And, 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 and as a result, you know, the school is charged with trying to come up with measures that can address student misconduct. And so <clears throat> more and more we're looking at um, elements of social reform, whether it's social justice or reformative justice and those kinds of things. Are, are these programs that you're also using within the prison system? No, not uh, not uh, social reform or uh, reformative it, justice, where you know th- there's some ownership of the perpetrator, and he has to somehow figure out a, a creative way, or they have a system that wherein he has to create create a um, a, a system of, of making right whatever wrongs he's committed. Yeah, uh, they there. I'm sure there's programs that uh, are like that, mm-hmm. uh, but we don't have any in place where I'm at right now. But uh, what uh, what you're talking about it does take place in our in our cognitive behavior intervention programs. Okay, and uh, where inmates talk about uh, their victims and what they did to their victims, and uh, they write notes, or they write uh, journal, a lot of journaling, okay. and they, they are they talk monitored about, by anybody? Oh yeah, yeah. We have our counselors. We have uh, counselors that uh, take uh, the inmates through. Uh, we have they use the uh, University of Cincinnati. They have this curriculum that uh, is very good. It's evidence based. Okay. And all of our curriculum, for the most part, that we use is evidence-based sure. uh, so that we're collecting the data to take and we're going to run meta-analysis with these to see, you know, where this is taking us towards reducing recidivism. Because without having a, you know, a, a compass to point us which way to go, we're just, you know, taking shots in the dark on this. Sure. Which was done a lot in the past. Let's try this program. Let's try it for a while. Well, it's not really reducing recidivism. So let's try this, and that's yeah. not really working. So let's try this, you know. And these all sound good on Trial the surface. Error. But, uh, you know, now we're getting more uh, drilling down, getting more fine-tuned on how we're doing this. So by getting uh, the inmates to uh, to journal, a lot of times uh, during these graduations, it's it's moving to hear their stories and what they, I can imagine. you know, what they've done, what they've come from, and what they would do to change if they could change, you know, the sure. Sure. You know, in terms of the school-to-prison pipeline, I know 
in this program so far, we focused on what happens once students have committed, uh, you know, uh, some misconduct or whether um, a person has committed something in the community or in society and wound up on the other side of the law. Yeah. But I think, you know, more and more we need to also look at some of the things that have happened, you know, in terms of our, our thought processes and, and our mores as a society. Um, I remember when I was in school, I got, I got paddled, especially in elementary school. And, you know, a lot of people don't like to talk about it. And, there, you know, all kinds of legislation <laughs> that says you can't. Increasingly, parents can't, you know, you can't <laughs> spank your kid. You can't do all these kinds of things. But I tell you, it really, I think, personally, it did work for me. And, you know, the more, sometimes I think about this stuff at home, believe it or not. And the more I think about it, you know, I, I think, you know, when when teachers were allowed to paddle kids and when parents certainly were allowed to discipline their kids at home without fear, things seemed to be a lot better in that regard. Well, we knew uh, what was expected of us really quickly. Absolutely. There was no uh, guess. So once you got paddled, you knew where you stood. Yes. <laughs> and so now, yeah. so now that the government now is kind of uh, mandating um, or, or just kind of governing what happens within our homes, I think increasingly it's creating a culture of fear. Yeah. Fear and pa parents are fearful. Parents yeah. are afraid. And then so you have this student now who has become, you know, incorrigible at home yeah. as well as in school. And so the student shows up and the teacher can't do anything with them. And then, like I said, the culture of fear. The teacher is afraid of the principal. The principal is afraid of the superintendent. Yeah. The superintendent is afraid of the school board. The school board is afraid of the parents. Right. Now parents are afraid of the kids. Right. And the kids ain't afraid of anybody. Right. So it's just like this whole culture of fear that's kind of upside down at these people. Turned around. It, you're, you're exactly right. I had the same. Uh, I got paddled too uh, by the, the the principal at the school I grew up. Oh man! Yeah. <laughs> I, I think he I'm kicked me to... like he like a field goal. I, <laughs> yeah. I remember he raced me off the ground, and, and I was so scared oh. after that. I I, yeah. I never just dis... that was it from that day forward. I never uh, you know misbehaved again. From third grade until about ninth or tenth grade, I got. I think that was about the same time. It was about third grade, and Routinely. I was so embarrassed. I didn't want anyone to know about it. And the principals would invite the teacher, would invite the referring teacher. Would you like to be in there when we? And almost always, the teacher wanted to be there to see me get my behind spanked. <laughs> and uh, it, it took about you know six or seven years before yeah. you know my behavior patterns turned around. And that Maybe. supports uh, what I said earlier. It's about four to seven in time. <laughs> we got data. So here we go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Qualitative <laughs> and qualitative data to support it. All right, so we know that sometimes legislation um, changes based on who's in charge. Yeah. So whether we're talking about state legislation or whether we're talking about um, things that are happening federally. So we know that we have a new governor yeah. in California, Gavin Newsom, and as well as um, new president and President Trump. And so I'm going to ask you, in terms of you know the prison system. Do you see, or what are some of the changes that are coming down the pipeline, whether state or the federal level, as it relates to? Well, the I uh, I just see uh, they're trying to reduce uh, within the state of California population because they're trying uh, to reduce the population. Yeah, because oh, uh, oh. it's uh, it's being monitored by a three judge panel. Uh, inmates that around two thousand nine filed a lawsuit for overcrowding. Because there was wait, uh, wait, hold up, stop the press. <laughs> Say that one more time. Who filed a lawsuit because they're the inmate population? They yeah. filed a lawsuit. Yeah, and it, it made it all the way to the Supreme Court. Who would have been a bit? Could they have benefited financially if? Like, no, but they, they benefited like by, by uh, for, for years. By, they had uh, conditions where they were overcrowded. I mean, the gymnasiums oh, okay. there were made uh, inhumane as dorms. Yeah, inhumane. Sure. And so the 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 population was one hundred and thirty or one hundred forty percent of you know, above normal. Wow. So they're going above, you know, too, too many people in too small of a spot. Because with the three strikes in the 90s, yeah. they didn't build prisons during that time to accommodate for all these guys they took in. So you got an influx of, yeah. of right. prisoners. And, and then, uh, and then uh, the prisons that they had were old, and they didn't build any new ones for, you know, quite a few years. So tell me about the lawsuit. So, so anyway, the lawsuit had made it all the way to the Supreme Court, and then the Supreme Court justices appointed a three-judge panel to oversee the prison population. Over okay, in the so state it's being California. monitored, yes. and new prisons are being constructed. Uh, on new prisons, basis. and then these programs like Prop 57, they put all these incentives in uh, with that to reduce prison population. And oh, it wow. seems to be working. It's good to know that folks are actually thinking, thinking yeah. about rehabilitation, thinking about uh, sanitary conditions. Yeah. 
and that kind of thing. Because, you know, there's a common thought that once you're locked up, you know, nobody really cares about you. They throw it with a key. Well, and that's, you know, that's a thought that I think still a prevailing thought with a lot of people. But, uh, you know, for those that do have loved ones that are locked up, they're seeing a difference. And they're coming to graduations that we have. Sure. Uh, they're they're noticing differences and you know they're 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 thankful that we're doing what we're doing right on so statewide changes and then um, what about federal changes federal changes uh now i'm not as versed because i've been in the federal uh, as a case manager years ago but um yeah, they've uh i think they're 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 enacting some changes as well uh, but not to the degree that the state of california is because they have different legisla- legislation and different guidelines. Okay. So um, their population is about 100,000, I think, um, over the whole 50 states or some thereabout. And see, California's is higher than the, the national federal uh, population. Hmm. So I wonder why. Any thought to why? Uh, well, the three strikes, you know. The okay. state, and it's a, California is a large state. Right. You know, our population base is going to drive those numbers up. That higher. makes sense. Yeah. Which brings me to another question. Um, and this is personal, and you can plead the fifth if you'd like. Any personal thoughts about the wall, the border wall? And, and Well, it's kind of funny. I was looking uh, on Facebook, and someone had put a meme on, and it showed the wall. I mean, it showed it from Mexico's side, and they had, like, this ramp, uh, nice, like, <laughs> multi-level ramp where you can just little, walk up like you go black. to a mall. They said, go ahead and build it, and we have no problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I, I, you know, I don't know. I don't like to talk about it, but it just seems like we can use those funds uh, better. In, in other ways. Yeah, absolutely. they can be better allocated. But, uh, you know, there's there's pros and cons, I'm sure, for it. Sure, absolutely. So I want to read, um, you know, we started out with this program and talking about the school to prison pipeline. Oh, and, and against it. I'm, uh, for it and against it, let me uh, say Okay, okay. Right, right on, for and against. Thank <laughs> yeah. you for adding that. So um, I want to read some statistics because actually there's some good and there's some bad news as it relates to the school to prison uh, pipeline. All right, and this is from the CDE, the um, California Department of Education, and their website. So there's a release where, and this is a little bit old, but it still is applicable from November 2017. Uh, The number of students suspended and expelled in California public school has declined for the fifth year in a row. So that was really good because the state was really looking at school data from the perspective of um, demographics of students who are being expelled routinely. And and that's how they learned that, hey, we're expelling brown and black students at disproportionate rates. Mm -hmm. And so um, they commissioned schools and school districts to come up with other ways to handle students instead of just kind of sending them to home. Because the truth is that you send somebody to home uh, to – you know, if a student shows up at school misbehaving. It's not really a good idea um, to send them home and expect them to return with a different mm-hmm. mindset yeah, right. when they, you know, that's where they came from in the beginning. Yeah, so anyway, um, the CDE has said that for five straight years, um, there has been a decrease in the amount of students that have been suspended or expelled in California, which is showing that efforts by educators to improve attendance by using more engaging instruction and effective discipline are, you know, making significant progress so you know when when we know better we do better but it does mean that we really do have to look at data and we have to analyze it because it does give us a narrative about what's actually taking place and i've I've heard that uh if we know better do better uh concept as well Mm -hmm. and uh, and it takes a village too it does it does take a village it takes a lot of people uh to change the change the culture and change uh, the environment that's right so uh, so i shared the good news (laughs) <laughs> but now, um, again, you know, reading from the, the first um, website that I, I looked on with the Dignity in Schools campaign, here's what they would uh, say to that piece of information. This new information demonstrates that efforts by educators all over the state to find better ways to engage students in learning and addressing behavior par- problems, you know, they are paying off in the form of greatly reduced suspensions and expulsions, which translates into more students uh, being in class. And uh, actually, that, that quote came from Tom Turlickson, Turlickson. Um, But And the bottom line is that students have to be in class to learn and to succeed and to develop their potential. But um, the Center for the Dignity in Schools uh, campaign has this to say. Though the data shows that suspensions have dropped in the last few years in California, many students still fall through the cracks, as, as we expect. Um, there will always be students falling through the cracks. Um, and enter the pipeline 
Furthermore, with the increase of police and school resource officers on campus, students can actually be arrested, uh, still arrested, yeah. which you know yeah. leads to even further problems down the line. So, you know, I, I watch a little bit of television. I'm as guilty as anybody else. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I'm noticing, one of the phenomena uh, that I'm noticing is that, you know, there's commentary about little children being afraid of, of police officers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for whatever reason, they are. And so I, I recognize that you're not a police officer. But, mm -hmm. you know, I think something has to be done because not all police officers are, ba are bad. We got some bad ones out there, you know. Yeah. Go yeah. to YouTube if you doubt that. Yeah. But, you know, there are a lot of good police officers. And I think that the relationship between the community and the perception um, about police officers needs to to change, but yeah. we need to put some pieces in place. I see that happening in the town where our facility is at. It's a small little town, predominantly uh, Hispanic population, mm -hmm. and the police uh, force it really focuses uh, a lot of interaction. You said it takes a community to to bring students up, and that's what sure. they're doing. Uh, they're doing a lot of community drives, and our company gets involved uh, with the police. Uh, department with the city and uh, we get involved with a lot of activities um, and I did an article I write articles a little on the side for a company and uh, in our monthly pub or quarterly mm -hmm. publication and I interviewed the police chief uh, about a year ago and and he uh, he really is pro you know uh, having different agencies work together you know to to, to make uh, make this thing work because uh, if you don't interact with the public they're going to have the stigma that you know the police are bad you mm -hmm. know because they're going to see what's on television and a lot of times it may not be the whole they don't see the whole thing uh, that happens you know sure. they may just see what's edited on television right uh, the good and bad and a lot of times we uh, you know what we see is is bad on tv right, right. and so i could understand uh i see the same thing that everyone sees and i'm just i'm asking myself why you know, so I have some of these same questions. So that's a big problem with a lot of uh, law enforcement agencies. Mm -hmm. So I, I know a lot are getting out there and trying to change that stigma and uh, get the community's support uh, to, to put this behind us. Sure. But uh, it only takes one incident, and a lot of the positive work is all of a sudden just kind of, you know, just kind of gone, gone away. It seems I, like. I totally agree. And here, here's what we all need to think about. The truth is, you know, anytime you have students who aren't showing up at school at the rates that they need to, or students who are even acting out in school, yeah. that suggests that there's something the matter, either yeah. in their home life or, or otherwise, but there's yeah. something the matter. And students, you know, first of all, California is a compulsory education state, meaning if you're, you know, anywhere from 6 to, to 17, you must attend school, so yeah. they don't have a choice. Yeah. But, you know, we have to look at students as what they are, which are they are minors, and oftentimes, you know, if they are in a lower socioeconomic uh, bracket, then they are probably attending schools where they are underserved. And by underserved, I mean either they have teachers who are apathetic, don't care, you know, when they are not showing up, you know, phone calls aren't being made, and that kind of thing, or they are sending students out anytime the student mm. slips and curse, you know, all yeah. that kind of thing, and you're just kind of banished to right. to hell, right. you know, for for doing things that uh, you don't know any better than because of whatever reason. And so, you know, one of the things that I recall from as an administrator in Southern California back in 2011, the state of California changed its truancy laws, okay. and you know, basically what it said was that anytime students are not in school for more than 10% of the time that they're enrolled, that the school is incumbent upon finding some measure to get them in the seats, right? And uh, <clears throat> But it was still upon the school in terms of how they roll that information out yeah. to parents and community. And some schools were very um, empathetic in their approach, recognizing that if students aren't showing up at school, um, more and more, it's it's kind of like the parents. It, it's you know, there's something the matter there, and so it's not okay. in the best interest of the school to penalize the student. And so, um, in our district, I think we did the same thing. That was our approach as well. And so, I was charged with creating a, what's known as a SARB panel, which is a school attendance review board panel. 
And so I, I consulted with probation officers as well as police officers and child welfare workers and the like. And every month we would look at our school's data and we'd look at the number of students who weren't showing up on time. And we'd bring the parents in because, remember, the state law had changed saying yeah. that, hey, if students aren't there, we're holding parents accountable to the tune of either, like, and this was the law, to the tune of $2,000 uh, fine or up to two years in, in jail or in prison, something like that. So on the surface it looked very punitive to parents but you know from a school district standpoint we had the latitude to, to have a, a different approach to that and not just kind of hit parents across the head right and right. so um, I thought that was a very good approach to build um, a panel that was comprised of all these agencies um, with the thought of doing what's in the best interest of students. So what we wound up doing was providing bus passes to students there you and, go. and finding out, you know, if you got transportation issues, you know, those kinds of things. Yeah. Those are the things that are hidden that uh, we don't see as uh, when we implement laws. Right. You know, they, the, there's usually a cause and effect, yes. you know, and we don't see what happens or the chain of events. They, it gets uh, from one point to the other. Absolutely. And so by what you're saying, by having this panel, and looking at all these these uh, these things that have happened where the student's not showing up, you're giving that person opportunity, that student opportunity. Absolutely. And that's what it's about because they're minus. But imagine if we were different as a district and we looked at that letter of the law and we said, you know what, we can hold parents accountable to, to the tune of $2,000. Well, if they don't have any money, what good, how is it going to benefit the student to now say to the parent, hey, your child hasn't been here for the last seven days. Now you owe us two thousand dollars, or well, and that's very or, or much send them to jail a, for is, two is years. Very much reality because what if you're a federal employee? You're not getting paid right now. Oh wow, that puts it into context. I mean, there, there's there's all sorts of things uh, that could be, uh, you know, the reason why they're not going to school right now, and and so it's easy to sit back and say, well, you need to have them there. I don't care, get them there. Uh, Man. There's always a reason why things happen. That's that's my opinion. I think your opinion really matters, and it, it's it's very credible. You guys, we're talking about the school to prison pipeline. We're talking about some of the causes. We're talking about certainly some of the solutions. It's been a pleasure to have Assistant Warner of the Golden State Prison, uh, Mr. Dan Myers, as our guest, our distinguished guest. We are out of time, but remember, if you've got a very hot topic or event or you have a very talented team in your home and you'd like to get some exposure, getting national exposure is as easy as being a guest on the Just As Easy show. I'm Dr. Chappelle Griffin. Thank you for joining us. Good night.